one thing which I find very commonly is people will refer to a plastic surgery procedure as purely cosmetic. And it's a phrase that people use in a well-meaning way, I think, but they're wanting to determine, is this something that makes a difference to someone functionally or is it purely cosmetic, as though there's some arbitrary line in the middle there and it falls on one side or the other. And I think it's, there is no line that something which is um, your external appearance that you show to the world or even the internal appearance that you only see when you look in the mirror is something so intrinsically um, you know, part of who we are that it's very difficult to separate that from something that's functional. Okay, it may not help you eat better or help you to walk better, um, but things that are missing, for example, a breast after breast cancer or an ear um, of a child who was never born with one ear, um, those are intrinsically linked to that, that whole sense of self. And if we really delve into how important that is, you know, we can't tell, I can't live in your shoes, I don't know how important something is to you, um, but I know enough from seeing hundreds of patients who've had these, these conditions that this is a, it's a major part of, of someone's um, sense of self-worth, um, well-being, and their sense of um, wholeness. And I ended up in the far-flung corners of the Scottish Highlands, and I met some long-lost relatives, and I made this discovery that I come from a long line of doctors, extending back five generations, and that my great-grandfather had been one of eight brothers, all of whom had become doctors. Yeah, so my, my daily work is divided between um, providing clinical care to, to my patients and also spending time wearing a different hat as a medical device developer. So my first uh, um, passion and love is actually to operate. I'm a surgeon and I um, perform uh, reconstructive surgery of the face, um, the breast and of uh, the whole body really. Um, for particularly for skin cancer, which is really prevalent in Australia. Um, but my fellowship interests and the things that I put a lot of extra time into is in the reconstruction of ears, uh, which is something that people don't know is a, is a thing. Um, and I did that for children um, who've been born without ears and also adults who have had their ears lost to things like trauma or cancer. My crochet is a fascinating condition. It's something which um, I first became aware of as a medical student and it really was the single condition that propelled me into my career as a reconstructive surgeon. I first saw a, a child born with, with the missing one ear and a surgeon recreate their ear out of rib cartilage. Um, and for me, the moment when the rib cartilage framework was inserted under the skin on the side of the head and the suction dressing was applied and the ear emerged out of the skin um, on the side of the head, to me, was a, my mind was blown. The rib cartilage is sculpted and shaped into the uh, structure that resembles an ear. It's then inserted under the skin and then the skin is elevated six months later to create an ear that, that sits out from the head. And this is a safe, reliable technique which is being performed for over 30 years. And uh, more recently, surgeons in the United States had started to use a foreign body, uh, actual plastic implant instead of using rib cartilage and started to implant this at a younger age. Uh, so children as young as uh, three or four uh, could receive this implant whereas the cartilage reconstruction we had to wait until the chest was fully developed and that would be more around the age of 10 to 12. And so um, these surgeons really uh, pushed the envelope of what was possible to be performed with a foreign body and, um, and have now turned that into a quite a reliable technique. Um, that uh, can be done in one stage with um, potentially fewer side effects and less pain. And of course, you don't have to do anything for a microtia. It's uh, an aesthetic deformity. Repairing the, and, and the structure of the outer part of the ear doesn't improve hearing. To do that, we either make a, a new ear canal or use a hearing implant, which is anchored to the bone. Um, so those two, two surgeries are, are in some ways separate from the reconstruction of the outer part of the ear, which is really an aesthetic operation. Which is not to say that it's not um, something that is meaningful to the patients. And there's really good evidence that the psychosocial benefits of your reconstruction for children who, who are self-conscious about their appearance um, it is quite profound. We've actually sent Max for a 3D scan of his, of his whole head and also of his good ear. And then uh, we've sent the scan of his, uh, of his good ear to a laboratory and we've taken the mirror image of that and 3D printed it. Um, in a biocompatible material that will replace the rib. I've implanted three 
custom 3D printed ear reconstructions so far in Australia and they've each been really different kids. Um, we had a, a really amazing first kid, a four year old, who was really aware of his difference at a young age, which is unusual. He uh, ultimately had a, an implant made for him that um, suited his, that fitted his face. It was a mirror image replica of the other ear, but made a bit bigger. So he now grows into it and he now has a big ear um, and instead of where he had a little ear in the past and his other ear is going to catch up as he grows. Boy, his mum tells me, is a huge um, sense of confidence. He, uh, a cute story was that he um, wanted his mum to take a photo of his new big ear and a photo of his other um, smaller ear that's going to catch up and put them both on the wall in his room because he's so proud of them. And uh, you know, as someone who uh, you know, did, that, did that operation, um, that makes me incredibly proud. So Sebastian was the first kid to have both the ear reconstruction and the hearing device implanted at the same surgery. He's an example of a kid that didn't really want to wear his, his uh, headband and the hearing aid. And so his dad would um, have to kind of convince him to, to put it on. But then when he had the magnet device, suddenly he was much more happy to put it on. He gets up first thing in the morning, he does is put it on. Um, which is, you know, he's feeding his brain extra information that it wasn't getting. Where um, we were all across the Facebook pages for the support groups and um, his name came up and it had a little story about what he was offering and um, the, all the work that he had done overseas. So I emailed him and back and forth and we set a date in December to go down to Sydney with Sebastian to meet him. and. Um, uh, he showed us photos of procedures he had done previously without using the 3D technology um, and we were impressed. He did a lot of charity work. We got his 3D scan done. When Sebastian saw that ear just, and having that held up next to his microtia ear, the smile was just so contagious. It was, like, it was huge. Confidence has gone up. Like before surgery, he didn't like going to new places where there were new people because he, would, he thought that everyone would look at his ear straight away. Um, and now he can wear glasses and they won't fall off or go lopsided. Um, and yeah, he's happy to meet new people and go to new places. We've got the conference coming up and he's, he's agreed to go up on the Q&A part of it and answer questions. and. Um, he makes friends a lot quicker now mm -hmm. and just at school his confidence around the classroom has gone up. Most recently I've discovered this field of implanted electronics. I was working in uh, a fellowship position in Harvard and my collaborators there have discovered uh, the ability to use targeted electrical activity to improve the function of muscles and my immediate first thought was well, we should be using this for, for children with, with muscle disability, with cerebral palsy particularly. Uh, it accounts for it's the single leading cause of disability in, in children. And to me, that was a, a condition that I had to try and help. I was effectively driven to do that. And I've been pushing pretty hard since then to uh, establish a, um, a pathway for a new medical device to enter that space. Cerebral palsy to me is a, um, a condition that I think hasn't received enough attention as for the level of disability that it, um, it is accountable for in our community, particularly in our children. I'm a doctor, I'm a, a surgeon, I'm also interested in this space. My number one goal is to try and enable parents to have that ability to watch their kids grow up normally, just like I have the privilege of watching mine. And I've partnered with an incredible team to be able to achieve this. We have Saluda Medical, an Australian biotech company who have an incredible device that we plan to use, which is a spinal cord stimulator. Now, why do we think that would work? The problem in spasticity is that there's too much electrical activity in the spinal reflex, and it's the wrong type of electrical activity. And much like cochlear implants can uh, give the correct signal to the brain to recreate hearing, and permanent pacemakers can give the correct electrical signal to a heart to enable the damaged heart to beat in the proper way, we can influence the firing rate of the spinal cord. Now, it's been shown to improve outcomes in chronic pain. It's never been tried for spasticity, and we're, we will be the first to do that. I have three uh, boys, all under the age of six, and I see the intense amount of 
um, development that goes on in those early formative years. And I think it's a travesty that we um, have children being born with cerebral palsy, um, that one in 300 live births is still affected by cerebral palsy, even though that number is coming down, which is great. That's still a large number of kids every year that are born with this condition. And we, gen we tend not to have great treatments to offer them um, really throughout the course of their life. And the follow, the follow on of their diagnosis is, um, is a real um, a difficult path that lies ahead. And they end up not to the level of, of uh, function and, and ability to participate in the community that you or I would want for our own child. So for me, when I saw that there was a potential treatment that could help um, alleviate some of that burden, uh, I was, I, I couldn't not take part in that. Hi Max, Dad's looking forward to taking a picture of your, of your new good looking ear. I hope you, it looks good and I hope my dad did a good work. I thought you, I, I hope you have good care. I, th I hope you're gonna take good care of it. See ya. Bye. Bye. They, they look over my shoulder, they ask who's this and what's that about and they, I don't hide things from them. Um, some things are hard, but most things I try and be honest. And they know my patients' names. Um, they ask about them. They actually send little video messages to them sometimes. Um, so they're, in, they're part of the journey and I want them to be involved. Um, at the Hear and Say conference that I presented at, they came along um, and they were part of the, the, um, the, the, the kids group that went off and, and played in the creche. So they, um, this, is, uh, you know, this is part of our life. It's not just my work.